Well, thank you, Adam. Thank you. It's a real pleasure for me to be here, especially because I graduated from UC Santa Barbara back in 1979, and so it's always a pleasure to come back to this wonderful location. So I've actually been working on the theory of how stars and planets form for, for well over 30 years. So I, I was working there before there was a there there, as you'll see in this talk. So what I want to do this morning is give you a little bit of the history of the field, tell you about uh, just a sort of an overview of the different techniques that are being used and sort of set up the entire program for the speakers later on in the day where you'll hear much more detail about their individual uh, techniques for, for finding planets and what we hope to find in the future. So as Adam said, basically this all just started a little over 15 years or so ago. Uh, in fact, here's the cover of Time Magazine from 1996. Uh, and uh, you know, 15 years is, seems like it's pretty recent in many ways and compared to uh, last year having been the 400th year of astronomy since Galileo started using a telescope, 15 years is practically nothing. Although if you look at this little political banner up here, it seems like it was a long, long time ago. A long time ago, possibly in another galaxy altogether. Uh, but you might wonder, you know, why did it take so long up until 1995 to find the first evidence for a planet around another sun-like star? Why don't we just take the Hubble out, say, and take a picture of it? We're sort of used to Hubble taking pictures of everything worth, worth taking pictures of. And here's the reason why. Here's a plot of the amount of light given off by the Sun, Earth, Jupiter, and Uranus as a function of wavelength. So here's visible wavelengths here where the sun's light peaks. Since it's a yellow star, most of the light is yellow light. And then longer wavelengths in the infrared, it drops off. And so for the planets at visible wavelengths, they just reflect the sun's light. And that's why their shape of the spectrum looks just like the sun's spectrum, pretty much, because it's pretty much just the same as the sun's light, just reflected back to us. But things get more interesting out here at infrared wavelengths where the planets have their own intrinsic heat, so they give off their own light. And so they get a little bit of extra light. You get the sun's reflected light as well as some intrinsic emission from the planet itself. And so there's, there's the basic problem. Here we have a, a difference of about a factor of 10, 10 billion or, or 1 billion, depending on which planet you're looking at, between how bright the sun is and one of the planets. Now that doesn't mean it's that, that bad. The planets are not that faint. These planets, if we could look at them in optical wavelengths, are no fainter than a very dim galaxy, sort of a so-called magnitude 25 galaxy that, that Hubble took pictures of and things like the Hubble Deep Field. If you sit and let Hubble sit there and grind away for a, for a couple of days, it'll take a picture of it. The problem is you've got this very faint object right next to something which is a billion times brighter. That's the whole problem, the contrast between the two. So if you're trying to use Hubble to look at something which is 10 billion times brighter, there's just no way. All the other light from the bright star comes in, scatters off all the in internal Hubble op optics and screws it up. You can't take a picture of it. So Hubble is not designed to do this, this picture. Things get a little bit better uh, at infrared wavelengths, of course, since it's only maybe a, a million to one ratio. And Jim Casting will be talking about these possibilities later on. Uh, but that's re really been the, the stumbling block to why progress was so slow in coming in this field. We couldn't just go out and plan to take a picture very easily. So instead, the really successful techniques began uh, in the mid-90s by finding the planets not directly by taking their picture, but finding them indirectly by inferring that the, that the planet is there. And the, the basic inference is based on something that we, that you as teachers have probably taught your students that, uh, which is not right, which is that the planets orbit around the sun. Wrong. In reality, right, the planets and the sun both orbit around this common center of mass of the system. So here is a highly exaggerated picture of the planet, which is one quarter as massive as its star, which is not real, but it means that the entire system orbits around sort of the balance point of a fulcrum, if you're imagining being on a teeter-totter. So in the case of Jupiter, which is out at roughly five times zero sun distance with a mass one thousandth the mass of the sun, it means that the sun orbits around a, a, the center of mass of the system every 12 years, Jupiter's orbital period, and it goes back and forth over a distance equal to its own radius, or the diameter all the way. So you could look at our sun from a nearby star, you'd see the sun for no reason at all, apparently, because you couldn't see the planets. The sun, hey, every 12 years, it's going around a circle in space equal to its own diameter. That's a pretty difficult measurement to make, you might think. But that, that angular change, if you're on a close nearby star, is equal to uh, one milliarc second, roughly, which is the same as a, basically a dime at 1,000 miles. It's a small angle, but astronomers think that they can measure that. In fact, this fellow here thought he measured it uh, about 50 years or so ago, Peter Vandekamp. And, uh, he was the director of the Sproul Observatory at Swarthmore College beginning in 1937. And the next year, 1938, he began a long-term program to try to find planets by watching the stars wobble. And he added a star called Barnard Star right away, because Barnard Star is actually the second closest star to our sun. 
uh, with the first closest being the Alpha Centauri uh, triple star system, and, which is about four light years away. Barnard star is the next closest, about six light years away. And you want to look at close by stars because if you're trying to see this little tiny wobble, needless to say, the closer the wobble is, right, the easier it is to see. It's 10 times farther away, it's a 10 times smaller wobble. So you want close by stars. You also want low mass stars. Barnard star is roughly one seventh the mass of the sun. Of course, the lower the mass of the sun is, if you're sitting on the teeter totter, it means you've got to be farther out to, to balance the, the planet out there. So lower mass stars wobble even more than more massive stars. So it was a perfect system, close by, low in mass. What did he find? Well, he took data on it, or he and his students took data on it for about 25 years. And finally, in 1963, they're ready to publish their data for Barnard star. So here's what's plotted here is basically the wobble of that central star as a function of time. Here's time going around this way on two axes that the astronomers use to label position on the sky, right ascension and declination. Just think of them as X and Y, basically, just horizontal and vertical. And there's a, there seems to be a wobble here. The, the dashed line is the, is the fit to the data points. These data points here are repeated because he's assuming that's just basically it's going to be periodic and go on and on. And the size of the data points says something about how much determination he, how, how much, uh, how much confidence he had in those. So there, uh, uh, the bigger dots mean he thought there was really a pretty good uh, systematic uh, or low error there. And here, these are a little bit more error prone. But basically, he saw there was a wobble here. And that wobble is what you would have if Barnard Star had a planet with a mass about 60% more massive than Jupiter, orbiting out at about 4.4 times the Earth's sun distance. So pretty close to um, Jupiter's uh, orbital distance of 5.2 times Earth's sun distance, which is an AU astronomical unit. And uh, the only odd thing about it was that the orbit is a little bit, uh, it's not circular. If it was a circular, this would just be a nice, perfect sine curve. Instead, this has a little bit of a cuspiness to it. So it's sort of eccentric orbit, which is strange. But they figured, well, you know, maybe some, some other solar planets have an eccentric orbit. So this became literally the textbook example of a planet. Astronomers and physicists have thought, gee, there should be no reason why we are the only planetary system. There should be others out there. And well, here's the first one. Everybody was happy. Classic, classic textbook planet. And then uh, along came George. George Gatewood did a PhD at the University of Pittsburgh, and, uh, uh, and he uh, didn't really want to do it, but his thesis advisor said, you know, you really should look at Barnard's star and see if that really is real or not. And he was sort of kick dragging, scheming, and screaming into it. And he used a whole other set of information. Instead of using the Sproul Observatory plates, he used plates taken of Barnard's star by different, uh, different telescopes, the Van Fleck Observatory, and their own Allegheny refractor at the University uh, at the Allegheny Observatory. And, uh, and he did that for his PhD research. He also worked with one of the leading theoreticians, Heinrich Eichhorn, and they began using a, a brand new plate measuring machine at the US Naval Observatory. When Van Dekamp did his work, he had students sit down with a little plate measuring machine and try to figure out the center of that, that grainy emulsion to within one part in 100 or so. That was sort of the accuracy they were looking for. Instead of having a person sit there and try to measure the center, the photo center on the emulsion, uh, he used an automatic plate measuring machine. So you hopefully you take some of the human errors out. And uh, in 1973, he and Eichhorn published their result of Barnard star. Just showing you one of the axes here. Again, as a function of time, basically. And the dashed line is what you, uh, was the, basically the orbit that Van Camp had found. And here are the data points. Uh, again, the larger the size of the point, the more belief they had in it. This one, you should not believe at all because it's actually a speck of dust that uh, came along when I, <laughs> when I converted from slides to PowerPoint many years back. And uh, it's amazing, but it, it, uh, it does fit the line quite nicely. You know, uh, 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 Van Camp would have liked that one. Uh, but basically, you, know, you should put a lot of fact is that this guy here is nowhere near. And this is the one that really was a pretty solid data point. It's no, nowhere as close to it. And so, Gatewood and Eichhorn were very gentlemanly about it. They simply said, we see no evidence for the perturbation due to a planet of Barnard Star. And at that point, the, sort of the field fell into a deep sleep. Barnard Star began disappearing from the new textbooks, as you can imagine. Well, we better cross that one out. We're back to having no planets at all. And that's when, the, the, sort of, as I say, the field fell into a deep sleep for a good 20 years, sort of a Rip Van Winkle type thing. And then uh, people realized, well, there are other ways to try to find planets. And it's back again to the, uh, the center of mass motion, although this time you don't try to see the wobble of the star in the sky. You actually try to find the wobble of the star in velocity space. So if you're sitting over here on Earth looking back at the star, which is going around every 12 years, in the case of Jupiter, at a certain point of its orbit, it's going to be moving away from us. So it's light that it sends back to us is redshifted. Half an orbit later, it's moving towards us. The light is shifted. 
as it's moving transverse across the line of sight. It's at its rest wavelength, you might say. And the amplitude of, of this velocity change is roughly, for Jupiter or on our sun, 13 meters per second, or 30 miles per hour. Now, if you've got a cop with a radar gun going 30 miles an hour over the limit, you're going to get a ticket, right? So it seems like that shouldn't be hard to measure. But as you'll hear from Deborah Fish later on, the problem is that that 30 miles per hour, you have to divide that by the speed of light in order to get the, the change in wavelength that you're trying to see, if you're trying to see that, that Doppler shift. And that becomes a very small ratio. That's like a factor in, in, a, in, a, in a, let's see, a 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, like 10 million to, to 100 million or so. So it's a very small change in frequency. It's like, I believe, on one of the uh, <clears throat> spectrographs that, that Deborah and other folks use, that's even a Jupiter-type signal, which is pretty big, it, it amounts to a shift of about 100 atoms on a CCD detector. So it's a very tiny shift. So how do you do it? Well, volume. You just have to have a lot of photons, knock the noise down, and you can actually do that. So the first guys who came along to get this to work are these two here. Bill Mayor was just walking down the hallway a few moments ago, he and his younger colleague, Didier Kalo. They had begun a, a, a ground-based radio velocity or Doppler shift search for stars right around 1994. And, um, now, already in 1994, they began noticing the star called 51 Peg was sort of a, looks like something interesting was happening to it. But by the time they realized 51 Peg seemed to be wobbling, 51 Peg was getting too close to the sun, so you couldn't really observe it very well. They had to wait another six, eight months or so for 51 Peg to come back up into observing season. So by the summer of 1995, they began looking at 51 Peg, got all the time they could look at, looked at it every night, every night, every night, every night. And after the end of an eight night observing run, they decided we need to write a paper to nature. And here's their data. From 1995. This is now showing the wobble in velocity space as a function of time, basically, with again these sort of, this is a, a periodic orbit, presumably, so they kind of repeat the data points over and over again. So, beginning of the orbit, end of the orbit. And the, uh, the amplitude of this is around 55 meters per second or so. And that works out to be the amplitude you should get for a, and this is a sun like star, 51 peg, much like our own sun. And that amplitude is what you would get if you had a planet with a mass of half the mass of Jupiter. <coughs> It's on a nice circular orbit because it's a nice sinusoidal curve. Everything's fine, sounds wonderful. The only surprise was the period of this orbit was 4.23 days. That means with Kepler's laws, that planet is orbiting in 100 times closer to its star than Jupiter is. It's really in close. It's really going to be hot as a result, something that, that Adam Burroughs has worked on along with other folks in the field to understand what these planets would be like. But that was pretty much a total surprise. I, as a theorist, feel bad about this because I published a paper earlier in the year saying, hey, basically we're going to be finding planets farther out, not inside, and this one just totally blew away that, that theoretical notion. Um, so, but that's, that's how progress is. When you can, you know, nothing pleases an observer more than to disprove a theorist. This really makes them happy. <laughs> they, this is what they, they live for. You know, and theorists are sort of masochists, so they keep going anyway. Okay, but the really exciting thing about this was that uh, it was a four-day period, so basically if you have four nights of telescope time, you can go out and see if these guys are crazy or not, or this is an instrumental effect. So once this was announced at a conference in Florence, Italy in October, other astronomers, those that had telescope time, rushed out to take their own data. And here's the confirmation data from Jeff Marcy and Paul Butler. This is a really fuzzy slide because this is the best slide that Jeff could send me back then. They were sort of strapped for money. This is, a, this is sort of like a a measure of, of, of how poorly funded the field was back then. You throw, th sent me this old slide, which I converted. But you can see the same wobble, exactly the right period, 4.23 days, uh, 50 uh, meters per second of amplitude. They confirmed it. So it's unlike Barnard's star, where the claim went away. This one was real. Other groups did it as well. I really like to keep this slide because, to me, you know, these guys have, and, and Deborah Fisher, their colleague, have gone on to become the, the leaders in the field in many ways. So this is, having this slide is to me like having a, you know, a Babe Ruth rookie card. You know, keep, <laughs> this is when you keep locked up in your, in your file cabinet. Okay. And just to show you what uh, Paul Butler and Jeff Marcy looked like a long, long time ago, Deborah will laugh in the background. This is, this is the, the two of them shortly after this discovery in 1995, 1996, in the, the dome of the Shane Telescope up Lick Observatory. A couple of young and crazy guys back then. Okay. Now, so this is sort of what the radio velocity folks had found as of, uh, say, six years or so ago. And as, as Adam pointed out, there are now over 450. This plot would be considerably more crowded, but it gives you a feeling for what the population has, has, uh, has become. So what's plotted here is the mass of the planet uh, as 
and, and, and their distance from the star, assuming in this case that the stars are roughly all solar mass, which is, is a fairly good approximation. Uh, and notice also I have the sine i in here because for the radial velocity, you're only really picking up the component of radial motion along your line of sight. So you really only know, sort of know the minimum mass of the planet. If the, if the orbit is aligned more nearly face on, you're only picking up a certain component of the velocity. There could be a lot more wobble elsewhere. So you could have a much bigger planet making a big wobble, but you're only sensing a small portion of it. So it's really only the minimum mass that you're seeing. But it turns out that effect is not big. If you correct for that on average, it's only a factor of 30% uh, uh, higher mass. So these, these numbers are, are reasonably good. And you'll notice there's sort of a green barrier I put here to show that uh, the folks who do these Doppler detections have been pretty cautious. They, they sort of wait until they see an entire orbital period before they claim that they've detected something. And so if the surveys have been running for maybe 10 or 12 years, you really can't find anything much out here because you haven't watched an entire orbital period. So you can imagine this green bar is sort of being a curtain which is being pulled slowly to the right as the, as the surveys keep going. And this little gray area down here is a, oh, it's a more fundamental curtain, which is blocking our vision of what's there, which is basically the instrumental noise as to how much, how low in mass you can go. And as instruments get better, this, this whole area tends to go farther and farther down. But you can see from what's here that you can imagine if this curtain gets pulled back, uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff out here. You, know, you can just sense from the, of course, part of it's because it's a log log plot, but there are going to be a lot of planets out here, a lot of more. Uh, solar system-like planets like our own Jupiter and Saturn, and that is indeed the, in the case. As more and more observations keep going, we find more and more of these planets. So that's mostly all discovered by Doppler spectroscopy. There are other ways of finding planets as well. Uh, the second most successful one at this point is called transits, which simply means if uh, you happen to have a planetary orbit aligned just the right way so the planet passes in front of the star every orbital period, it will block some of the star light. This is the transit or the uh, primary eclipse or the secondary eclipse for the back or occultation as people like to call it pre uh, preferentially. In the case of a Jupiter-sized planet around a sun-like star, Jupiter is roughly 10 times smaller than the star, so it means its surface area is 100 times smaller. So you're basically blocking 1% of the star's light. You think, well, okay, uh, that can't be too hard to do. Uh, and especially when you're in close for these hot Jupiters, uh, if you're in it only maybe uh, 5 or 10 or 20 solar radii away, you actually have a pretty good chance of having that orbit inclined. Oops. See, uh, randomly inclined orbits, there's basically a 10% chance if you're in that close that one of them is going to transit in front of the star. So by the time we had 10 hot Jupiters, we're wondering, hey, how come we haven't seen one transit yet? We, you know, something's wrong here. Well, turns out that 10th one did transit. Nature is having fun with us. She had us wait for the 10th one to transit. It's HG 29458b. Here's the light from the star dimming over a period of a few, few hours on two different uh, uh, transits. Uh, and it was not that hard to do in retrospect. This is actually, this is data taken by a four inch telescope in a parking lot in Boulder, Colorado. Turns out amateur astronomers can really help with this sort of stuff. They, they can do this sort of CCD uh, uh, device. I mean, CCD is just basically the same thing as what you have in a digital camera. If you have a good digital camera on your telescope, you know where to point and when you can measure it. David Charbonneau and another competing group, uh, the California Carnegie Group with Je uh, Jeff Henry, also measured it as well, essentially simultaneously. They both found this one. And the really nice, nice thing about this is it really tells you something more about the planet that you wouldn't know otherwise. First of all, because these things are very hot Jupiters, they're in close, and it also meant that they could do follow-up spectroscopy of the planets. In this case, uh, this is, you like to think this is a Hubble image. It's not quite a Hubble image. But, hu but Hubble, uh, Hubble uh, a little bit of artistic license here, but Hubble was a actually able to measure uh, the emission of Lyman alpha emission, which is hot hydrogen. Uh, from HD 29458b, and that emission is given off at ultraviolet wavelengths, which is kind of blue, and so the artist says, well, let's just make it look blue. So if you had ultraviolet eyes, maybe that's what it would look like, but it's, it's kind of correct, but it gives you a feeling for what it is. You know, that's the one problem with indirect de detection techniques is you have to use your imagination to, to think what it really would be like, because it would really be nice to have a giant real Hubble picture of this, but someday we'll have that, and Jim Casting will tell us about it, but for the moment we have to kind of let our imaginations run wild as the artist has done here. So the other great thing about, about having a transit is you really can nail the mass for sure because now you know that orbital inclination. That planet is passing in front of the star, 
can actually sort of time it and know exactly what the angle had to be from the amount of time that it took crossing the star. And if you have a, if you have a mass, and you also have a, have a radius because you know how much of the star's light was blocked, then you, wait, you have a density. So all right, let's plot. Here are the first couple dozen transiting planets that were found plotted as a function of their radius, units of the Jupiter radius, and their mass in terms of Jupiter mass. And Jupiter and Saturn here, and then these dotted lines are what you would have for a planet of a, of a certain uniform mean density, 1.33 for Jupiter, uh, 0.7 for Saturn. And uh, unfortunately, again, you can see that Mother Nature is having some fun with us. She's not just giving us sort of a single curve or two. She's throwing things kind of like a shotgun blast here. Just, oh, let's just, let's just make a few of all different types here. And so there are some that are really large and fluffy. They're very low density, like HD29458b. That's, of course, easiest to find because it's the biggest radius. And so you're going to find the big radius, the big uh, dimmings first. Uh, but there are also some really pathological ones, like this one down here, which is very small, very dense. And this one is thought to have something like uh, an inner composition of composed of maybe 80, 70 to 80 Earth masses of rock and ice, and over only 20 or 30 Earth masses of gas, hydrogen, helium gas on top of that, as opposed to Saturn, where it's more like maybe 15 Earth masses of uh, gas and ice, another 80 or so, uh, sorry, around 15 Earth masses of rock and ice and another 80 or so of gas on top, or Jupiter, we're not even sure if it has a core or not. So there's a whole range from objects which don't seem to have any rocky core at all to ones which are mostly rocky core and not too much else in them. And we only learn that from transiting systems, so they're extraordinarily valuable. Now, the RV folks have continued to, uh, to improve their, their measurement precision, and they're pushing down to the realm where they find not only gas giants, but objects that we call super-Earths, because they're down in the mass range of 5, 10, 15 Earth masses. So here's back to Discovery Space again. And uh, this is that sort of that instrumental noise line. And when you lower instrumental noise down here, you start finding objects down around here. These things, some are again pretty close in. They're, they're hot because, you're, again, you have a bias towards finding the short period systems first. But some of them are a little bit farther out. They're sort of around the range of Uranus and Neptune mass, though, sort of 15, 20 Earth masses or so. Earth is a little bit farther down off the line here. And the real question is, you know, what, what really are these things? Uh, they're super Earths in the sense of being that mass range, but we don't really have a clue necessarily as to what their interior composition is. Perhaps they are simply ice giants which wandered in. And that's not as strange as you might imagine because our leading theoretical explanation for these guys in here, these hot Jupiters, is that they probably formed out here where the warmer and cooler Jupiters are and somehow migrated in because it's very hard for theorists. Well, given their track record, you might not care much, of, much for the comment. Uh, it's hard for theorists to imagine forming them directly in here. So right now, there are actually more theorists who worry about migrating planets than making them. That's become really a major industry. And there's a pretty good understanding of mechanisms how the planet can interact with the newly formed disk and migrate inwards and end up left on these little parking orbits where they are left for us to find. But the question is then again, well, you know, it'd be nice to know what a density is one of these things. So again, we had a roughly 10 or so hot and warm super-Earths found. We're still waiting for one of them to transit. And it turns out that the first one that transits was actually the first one found. Even though we'd found 10, it turned out the first one discovered actually was transiting. It was just a little bit hard to measure that transit, but it was, it was again, measured to, to a transit by a rather small telescope in an observatory in France, Gliese 436b. Uh, and when folks got the, the mass of this thing, it turned out to be fairly massive. I think it was about 22 uh, Earth masses or so. And for its size, it works out to have a density of about 2 grams per cubic centimeter, which is actually about what you would imagine if you took Uranus or Neptune and brought them in and melted them in close. Uh, so it looks like it could simply be an ice giant planet, which just happened to migrate in, got melted perhaps because it's very close by. And so it really is not necessarily a hot super, it's more a hot uh, super ice giant, perhaps, this one. On the other hand, there are a number of others which have been found, which are not quite so massive down here in this area here. And the really key thing about them is that they tend to have outer gas giant siblings. Like Lisa 876 here, here's green. It has a couple of gas giants a little bit farther out. 55 Cancri has three more gas giants out there. Mu Era again has three more gas giants out there. So you have this inner super Earth mass object with some outer gas giants. That's an architecture that reminds you of something that we're familiar with, our own solar system, right? Terrestrial planets inside, gas giants outside. If you want to imagine that these 
These, now, on the other hand, Gliese 436 seems to be a solo, as far as we know. We don't know of any other gas giants out there, at least that I know of published. But these guys here, you say, well, maybe they perhaps migrated in from out there, just like Gliese 436 did, perhaps. But if they did that, how do they get past the gas giants? In our own, our own solar system, we think that the terrestrial planets are inside the gas giants because we formed inside the gas giants. And for whatever reason, our solar system did not undergo much planetary migration. But I think what this is telling us is, from this architecture alone, that these guys probably formed inside there. They may have migrated a little bit. Maybe all of the planets moved in a little bit. But they probably formed interior to the gas giants. And I think that means that the best analogy for what they really are, if we actually knew their densities, is they probably are super-Earths. They really are the tip of the, uh, of the uh, spectrum of terrestrial mass planets. OK, now there's a third technique which has been successful as well called gravitational microlensing. It was actually predicted by Albert Einstein back in 1936, although he never really thought it would work. He just, just thought it was too technically impossible to find one of these events. The idea is to look at a couple hundred thousand stars, uh, again with a telescope that sort of stares, and, um, and watch the brightness of the star change with time. And so you're looking at a background star, for example, and if there happens to be a foreground star, which you really can't see, it just happens to be by chance passing in front of that background star, then the light from that background star watch well, would be bent by Einstein's laws, by the gravity of the foreground star. And so lens star in the background, for a period of time lasting about a month or so, that star will brighten up and come back down again as this foreground star bends light towards us. OK, that's called a gravitational microlensing event. When one of these things occur, they send out email circulars everywhere around the world. And anyone who has a telescope watches that microlensing event because they're hoping to see on top of that month-long brightening and fading, a little spike or two. If there's a little spike on top, that probably means there's another, another object there, like a planet. The planet, even though it's lower in mass, can still bend light also. And in terms of the overall bending, it'll get extra bending. So when you fit those curves and try to figure out what the best model is, you can often infer the presence of a planet around this foreground object, which you don't even know. You don't even see this thing at all. You just know that it's done something, because indirectly, it's brightened up the background star. So that technique works, and those folks have found almost a dozen by now. The first one was found by a telescope down in Chile at Las Campanas, our Carnegie Observatory. And this is the rather unremarkable background star, which happened to be lensed. So this is, we don't, of course, we don't see the star that actually has the planet. This is, just happens to be the one that had the star in the foreground pass in front of it. Not very exciting. Again, this is not a Hubble image or even a Carnegie image. This is an artist's conception of what this planet might look like orbiting around its own red dwarf star. And we don't know what that star was like, but we just know from statistics of nearby stars that most stars are low mass red dwarf stars. And so most likely, it probably was a so-called M or perhaps K dwarf. So what have they found? Here's back to discovery space with some of the uh, uh, dozen or so discoveries made. And they fall into basically two classes, the sort of the Jupiter mass objects, which are now cold Jupiters, because this, this technique works preferentially for planets at just the right distance from its star to give you an extra bending of light. Uh, it's called the Einstein ring, in honor of Einstein, of course. And it, basically, for a solar mass star, it works out to be something like the asteroid belt in our solar system, two or three times uh, the Earth's sun distance. So they're not quite as cold as Jupiter, perhaps, but they're, if they're lower mass stars, that makes them colder as well. So they really should be cold, cold Jupiters. But they also see a population of objects even lower in mass, down to as low as about four or five Earth masses, which are cold again, and they're certainly in the super-Earth range. Um, and so there's, and the fact that they actually find almost as many of these as of the Jupiters is really interesting, because these guys are harder to find, as you can imagine. The, the, uh, the events are, are shorter and not quite as large. And the fact that they find nearly as many of these as these implies that there must be a lot more super-Earths out there than Jupiters, which is kind of another constraint on how these things form. All right. So we have evidence from Doppler velocities that there are hot and warm super-Earths. From microlensing, we have evidence that there are cold super-Earths. We're getting the feeling that there are a lot of objects which probably are terrestrial, rocky planets, much like our own Earth, which is, of course, in many ways, the whole goal of this field, is to try to find another habitable world. Now, more recently, a fourth method has begun to find planets, just what we sort of talked about at the very beginning, direct detection, actually just going out and taking a picture. So here is a, 
one of the claims from just a couple of years ago of a star called HR 8799. It's a somewhat more massive star than the sun. It's 1.5 times the solar mass. And um, this is direct detection from the ground. And you'll notice this blotchy thing here. This is the problem that I hinted at very earlier on about why Hubble can't take a picture, because you try to block out the light from the star, even with a rather sophisticated so-called chronograph, which is sort of like putting your thumb over the star so you can see what's next to it. If you do that as best as you can, uh, you still end up with all this leftover stray light from the star that you just really can't do, it, do anything with. So this, this whole plot now is on the scale of sort of the, uh, the entire solar system would fit in down here. And so if you're trying to find something in at Earth-like or Jupiter-like distances, you, you know, you, you'd say, hey, there, gee, there should be Jupiter and there's Earth. Well, no, that's not Jupiter and Earth. That's just light from the star. But if you go far enough out, you have a hope of getting rid of that scattered and diffracted light and actually seeing real light from a planet. And that's what these folks were able to do. So there are actually three planets in the system, not just one. And they were able to follow this over time, make sure that they really are associated with the star. They're not just some interloper background galaxy or, or star that happen to be in the field of view. And if they do a theoretical model for what the um, masses of these objects should be, based in part on things like Adam Burroughs' predictions of the luminosity of a planet's function of time, given what they think the age of the system is, the estimates are such that you think that this guy here has about seven Jupiter masses, and these two C and D are around 10 Jupiter masses. So that's, uh, that's down the Jupiter, sort of the planetary mass range. If you're below roughly 13 Jupiter masses, you're called a planet, because above that, you're able to burn deuterium. And so we call them brown dwarfs instead of planets, although they might very well form by the same mechanism. And so this is the first uh, really, really clean direct detection. There's another one also announced uh, where Hubble, this, this is ground-based, but Hubble also took a picture of the FOMOHOT system. Um, and that's a case where they have a planet embedded in a ring system. And uh, I won't show that one here as well, but uh, both of those groups actually, the, the group that did this detection as well as, as the, uh, the Hubble FOMOHA group, uh, won the Newcomb Cleveland Prize of the American Association for the Advancement of Science this year. I would happen to be in San Diego a couple of weeks ago in those groups, um, won, you know, won the prize for the best paper published in science last year. So that's pretty neat uh, acknowledgement of the importance of this field. Okay. So where are we right now? This is a, it's kind of hard to keep the Discovery Space plot up to date because as, as Adam says, it sort of changes. It's like, a, it's like looking at the population of the world clicker. You know, it keeps kind of, the clicker keeps going over and over again. So 450, 451, you know, by the time we finish today, it'll be 452 and a half maybe. Uh, here, <clears throat> masses and orbits. You can see, we've, you know, given that 15 years ago, we basically had nothing, we've made some progress. But the really exciting thing is to try to get down into the blue box here, the habitable zone, which I'm sure Jim Casting is, will talk about. It's something, concept that he has much to do with having in, uh, uh, realized. Uh, and we're not quite out at finding planets in this range yet, uh, but we're getting there. It's just a question of having the direct detection folks be able to get a little bit uh, lower mass objects and having the radio velocity folks do their surveys for a little bit longer. Uh, and we've got a couple of really close candidates that are you know, either a little bit, uh, little bit too cold or a little bit too hot to be in the, in the Goldilocks zone here, to, to just be right to have liquid water on the planets, but we're, we're getting pretty close. And we certainly have no feeling that when we can really drop the curtain down and see what's down here, we're expecting to see an awful lot of objects down there. So it's a very hopeful time for the field. We still have a great goal, yet we haven't achieved it yet. You know. If you actually achieved your goal, we'd say, oh, all right, well, what's next? But no, we're, we're still in the phase where we're saying, hey, we've got something great to do. We haven't done it yet. Help us do it. So a lot of the future work is being focused on what can be done from space. Uh, the French and the Europeans, and I think Brazil was involved as well, launched this space telescope back in um, late 2006 called CORO. It stands for Convection Rotations in Transit. It's really primarily designed to study stellar oscillations, watching the brightnesses of stars change as a function of time and using that information to infer how they're vibrating and understanding through seismology, in essence, what's inside the star, how dense the core is and the structure of the star as a function of radius. But the T on the end is transits. And that's the key thing from our point of view, which is, of course, they're looking at typically 10,000, 20,000 stars at a time, watching them vibrate. But every once in a while, one of them dims because it has a planet pass in front. So the Crow mission has been out looking for planets as well. Uh, and they have found, uh, depending on how you count, maybe seven or eight of them. Well, they found a brown dwarf or two. Perhaps the most exciting is this one was just announced earlier this year called Crow XO7b. And this one holds the record right now for being the smallest radius transiting planet found to date. 
So it's a, this, the, this dip in the light curve, which you can see in very, it's very small. This is parts, uh, three parts in 10,000. That's a very small dip. That's what you get with a 1.68 Earth radius object passing in front of, a, of, of this particular star. I think it was a K dwarf star. Uh, and it turns out they're also able to do a radio velocity follow-up to see if they could measure the Doppler wobble. That was the hardest part of the measurement. They took a, spent a lot of time with large telescopes and, and the, the 3.6 meter La Silla as well to try to measure the Doppler wobble. It, was, it wasn't easy because the host star was kind of a noisy star, but they finally got a Doppler velocity out of it, and that turns out to have a mass of roughly five Earth masses. Again, since you have a radius and a mass, you can get a density, and voila, this time the density didn't turn out to be two, turned out to be 5.6, which again says, hmm, what's Earth's? 5.5. Well, of course, this is five Earth masses, and so if you took five Earth masses of stuff exactly the same composition of, of Earth, it would be compressed down to even higher density. So this means the true, the uncompressed density of this planet is not as, not as high as that of Earth, but it's certainly indicative of something which probably has a lot of iron and, and, and silicate and oxygen in it, much like the Earth does. So that's our best best example yet of a really Earth-like planet that we can prove really is mostly rock and not gas and ice. Progress. So, of course, the U.S. has been planning on doing this for many, many years, and it took us a good 20 years for us to launch our first space telescope intended to find planets. I've been working with NASA since 1988 to plan to do this. It's a history of frustration, but we finally got Kepler launched in 2009. And Kepler is, again, a transit detection satellite. It's looking for transits, and particularly it's geared specifically to find Earth-like transits. So we're not worrying about stellar variability, although that can be done as a subsidiary project. It really is designed from the ground up to do one thing and do it really well, find Earths. Now, for an Earth, here's actually a picture of Venus, which is an Earth mass, Earth twin, passing in front of the sun a couple of years ago, taken by an amateur from Northern Virginia. This brings home to you the fact that this is a little get, gets a little bit tougher when you talk about Earth mass transit because Earth is roughly 100 times smaller in radius than the star. So that means its surface area is 10,000 times smaller. So you're looking at about a part in 10,000 change in variation of the star. That's a pretty small dimming. Can you detect that? Well, that's what Kepler was designed to do. And we haven't yet had Kepler claim to have found any Earths, but that certainly will be coming in the next couple of years. So Kepler was launched, it's staring at stars and looking for the transit method to detect them. And the reason why we have to wait so long is that if you see a single transit go down, of a part in 10,000, okay, say, hey, there was a possible transit. We're trying to find Earths around sun-like stars. That means you have to wait roughly one year for that planet in the habitable zone to come around and make another transit. So you look at a star, here's one transit. One year later, you got another transit. Hmm, now I have a period, let's wait you know, one year later and see if it recurs the third time. If you see three of them, you start saying, hey, maybe it's real. If you really want to be cautious, you might wait for that fourth one as well. Now you're talking about three, four, five years in order to decide if you really found something or if you're just looking at noise. So by definition, even though Kepler was launched just about this time last year, it's going to be three or four more years until Kepler can really tell us how many Earths there are. Because there are a lot of things which can be interlopers along the way and give you false detections. And that's one of the big challenges of the transit detection field is to try to get rid of the false positives. So the way that Kepler does this is it stares at this field in Cygnus and Lyra, which is a southern constellation. It has uh, 48 CCD detectors, which are targeted right here. And they've, they've been done, chosen this field in order to be close to the galactic plane, where most of the stars are, but not too close so that you have confusion didn't want to go away from the galactic plane because then you don't have that many stars, so it sort of picked an optimal intermediate distance. Then they arrange the, the, uh, the orientation of the telescope so that the really bright stars, which happen to be in the field, kind of fall in between where there's, where there's no, no electronics. So you don't want the bright stars that are gonna fill up, you know, it's like taking a CCD camera rolling up to the sun taking a picture. You don't want to do that. So they arrange it to avoid the bright stars and, uh, and go ahead and take data. And you know, the strange thing about Kepler is it doesn't have any shutter on its camera. It had a dust cover, which is blown off shortly after it was put in orbit. It just sits there with its eyes propped open, sort of like a Malcolm McDowell in Clockwork Orange. And you realize, you know, it's kind of a Malcolm McDowell thing. You cannot shut your eyes. 
uh, that you don't want it to shut. So it, it stares and brings down data every 30 minutes or so and, and look to look for transits. And just this uh, January meeting of the American Astronomical Society in Washington, D.C., the principal investigator of the mission, Bill Baruchi, showed this slide with Kepler's first five planets. They're all short period planets because what I just told you, you really want to be able to see multiple transits to make sure that you really have something which is repeatable. We can't quite find things out with one year periods out here. And also the nice thing about these is they're, I mean, they're hot Jupiters. And from that point of view, that's not too exciting. Although this one here is again, a hot super Earth. That is exciting. It's making sense. It's fitting of what we know from the other, other techniques. Uh, and these are again, are easiest to find because they are short periods. So you can see multiple transits and you also, are able to follow them up by radial velocity. And that's the key point. Whenever you see a transit detection, if you just simply see transits, dimmings of the star, you're not quite sure if that's due to a planet or because there happens to be a, a background, really distant spectroscopic binary, which is which a couple of stars are, are blocking themselves out periodically, but it's blended in with your foreground star. You can't really distinguish them because Kepler is kind of a blurry picture. If there's a background spectroscopic binary, it can mimic a planet. But if you look at the Doppler wobble of that star and see it really is wobbling, then it must mean there's not a spectroscopic binary back there. So you throw away the false positives that way. A lot of ground-based work has to be done to follow it up. And the, um, I think the Kepler observing season for that field is beginning another month or so. So there'll be a lot of telescopes around the world going out and trying to vet the candidates that they're not telling us about yet. So that one year from now, we'll have probably a bunch of planets over here. Another year, we'll have some around here. And then you know, three years or so from now, we'll have how many Earths there are, which is the whole point of Kepler. Okay, but Kepler's Earths are, uh, they're all, all towards Cygnus and Lyra, so they tend to be 500,000 light years away. And that's great, and we all know how many Earths there are, but they're not going to be ones that we can follow up on. So to find the nearby Earths, uh, you could try to do an all-sky transit survey to find transiting nearby Earths, but you really want to find Earths around the closest stars. And then you're sort of back to Peter Van de Kamp, believe it or not, which is one of the best ways to try to find nearby Earths is to look at the nearby stars and see if they wobble. You can look for the wobble by Doppler methods. Perhaps uh, I'm sure that Deborah will talk about it as well. But another technique to try to find the nearest Earths is to see if the nearest stars are wobbling. So NASA has been planning to build this space telescope. This is one we've been planning for 20 years, haven't built it yet, called the Space Interferometry Mission. This is basically a, a, a six meter long space telescope, which will look at the closest stars and follow them in time for a couple of years and see if they wobble. This will measure a wobble, which is measured in microarc seconds. Now, Jupiter gives you a signal of milliarc seconds. This is a, this is a thousand times smaller. Microarc second astrometry, measuring the position of the star in the sky. This could do it. So if we were able, willing to spend the one or two billion dollars or so it costs to build this thing and get it launched, uh, we would find the 65 or so stars, how many Earths they have, know their orbits, and figure out uh, if any of them are habitable. But just finding out if you have an Earth mass planet which is in the habitable zone is not the end of the game. You also want to know, well, are they inhabited as well as being inhabitable? And then you have to worry something more a little bit about chemistry. Uh, the feeling is, though, if you really have a planet there, uh, we as theorists who are broad-minded, we think, by golly, if you've got a planet, you throw in a little bit of water, throw in some comets, which kind of are like big cans of Campbell's prebiotic soup, let it cook and stir, you know, for four, four and a half billion years. And there's a recipe here. I think it tells you how to, how to cook it. Put it in your microwave, covered in microwavable ocean on high, about 100 million years, uh, you know, heat cir circulating occasionally. So we think something's going to grow. You know, not, not necessarily all cavemen and dinosaurs, but there's probably going to be some, something equivalent to archaea, uh, some primitive, at least single cell life living there, which will give off chemicals which you can perhaps detect. So at the very least, we would hope to be able to find evidence for whether or not these planets are inhabitable or inhabited by studying their spectrum, something coming from the atmosphere of the planet. And there are basically two ways of doing that. One is that we sort of hinted at before the chronograph, where you put your, op, put your thumb over the star and try to block out the starlight, and then you do that at, at visible wavelengths. It turns out to work well. So here's a concept for the terrestrial planet finder chronograph, which was uh, designed a couple years back. Uh, uh, this is roughly a three and a half meter by eight meter telescope mirror with a big star shade around it, much like the James Webb Space Telescope star shade to block out sunlight, and a solar panel down here to give it power. 
might say, why in the world is it three and a half meters by eight meters? That's because, believe it or not, the largest launch fairings, rockets we have, are four meters in diameter. So you can't make an eight meter by eight meter go up in space. So you take a three and a half by eight, put it in sideways inside the rocket, launch it, then you take your three and a half meter by eight meter telescope and you rotate it and take pictures all the time and that gives you effectively the resolving power of an eight meter telescope. That's the idea. Now if you thought um, space interferometry mission was expensive, this one's really expensive. This is maybe five, six billion dollars. In a wonderful world we'd be building this already, but unfortunately NASA's funding for space science is not what we once thought it would be, so it's unclear when this will be built, but I think at some point we will build something much like this. So that's for optical wavelengths. If you want to go to the infrared wavelengths where things are not quite such a contrast problem, this is basically a thousand times better contrast problem, but you also have longer wavelength light, which means you have to make your baseline ten times longer, say, in order to have the resolution to pick up that planet, uh, then you really can't imagine building a space telescope that's 80 meters in diameter with a single dish. You want to make an interferometer where you have, say, 80 meters worth of 1.5 meter telescopes in space, which are combining their light as an interferometer, giving you effectively the resolving power of an 80 meter dish. This is the NASA concept of it from, again, a few years back. The Europeans are also very excited about cooperating with the U.S. in the whole field of extrasolar plants, but especially for building an interferometer, because they view interferometers as the future of space, future of astronomy in space. And so they have a concept called the X-ray, which NASA folks have studied as well, and the, uh, both JPL and the, and the ESA folks have agreed this is probably the ideal configuration where you put the collector spacecraft out of the plane of the four, uh, uh, sorry, the combiner spacecraft out of the plane of the four collector spacecraft and uh, combine the light that way. And it's sort of in this X array, which gives you a really good chances for detecting planets. It's nice that it's actually named after Charles Darwin's wife as well. Nice little touch for something which would really make a major advance in uh, understanding the origin and evolution of life in the universe. Oops, I skipped one there actually. So the key thing about both of these types of telescopes is it will tell you something about the spectrum of the star and that, sorry, the planet. And we've already made great progress in that. Here shows you some work from back on, on another one, the Hot Jupiters, HG189733, taken with the HST NICMOS instrument, where Mark Swain and a number of groups have been doing this. If you're very careful, you can actually understand something about the spectrum of the planet by either having the planet pass in front of the star during a transit and watch what happens with some of the starlight as it goes through the planet's atmosphere, or else watch the planet go behind the star, especially infrared wavelengths, and subtract off the starlight when the planet goes behind the star from what the light was just before the planet disappeared, where you have the two light combined, you can do those very delicate subtractions. You can actually see features that are attributed to the atmosphere of the planet. And for example, for this uh, hot Jupiter here, there's evidence for CO2, water, and carbon monoxide. And these CO2 and water are two of the so-called biomarkers. CO2 is a characteristic molecule for terrestrial planets like Earth, Mars, and Venus. Water, of course, is what we want for habitability. If you add in as well oxygen, oxygen on Earth primarily comes from photosynthesis over the last at least two billion years or so. If we actually saw oxygen, we would think there might be some sort of, perhaps uh, in large abundance, some sort of photosynthesis going on in that planet. If you actually saw methane as well, methane also comes from our planet from a combination of methanogenic bacteria and dairy cattle. I won't tell you how the dairy cattle produce it, but I'll let you guess. guess. But if you actually find evidence for oxygen and methane on the same planet in sizable abundances, that probably means that there is some sort of life form, life forms there, which generate oxygen and which generate methane, coexisting habitably, equally habitably on that planet. And then we have evidence for a planet which is not only inhabitable, but is inhabited. Then things would get really exciting. We'd want to build perhaps something like the terrestrial planet imager. Uh, but uh, this one is really even beyond uh, my lifetime hopes because this gets really expensive. Even to try to, you know, we'd like to have a picture like that, but even for something kind of poorly resolved like this, the collecting area, let's see, and the uh, visible is 576 square meter and the baseline is 120 kilometers. So it's like a couple of football field telescopes that are 100 miles apart. So uh, that's like the, uh, well, I suppose you could have done it with the stimulus money, I guess, a trillion dollars. But we, that would have. That would have done it. So, you know, a little bit of inflation, maybe. Maybe it's not out of the question. That's right. A couple of years ago, this seemed ridiculous, but nowadays it's not so ridiculous. All right, so that's where we are. 
Uh, that gives you a feeling for uh, where we are right now, what the history is. So hopefully I've set the stage for, for Deborah and Jim and, and Adam to tell you more about the great details. If you should by some chance be masochistic yourself enough to want to know more about this, I will unashamedly say that you can buy a copy of my book with a similarly titled, it'll be out in paperback in the fall. Thank you very much. So uh, this is really great and interesting, and, and it's always so hard to keep up with all the recent discoveries. But you know, we we look at these pictures and we see, okay, so there's a star and it has you know a planet around it. But what we don't see is there's a star that doesn't have a planet around it because why would that become interesting to people? With that, with with that as 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 it may, and realizing that you're looking away from the the crowded part of the galaxy. Can you speculate on the probability or the percentage of stars that would, in your belief, have um, uh, solar systems? Mm -hmm. but, so that, that one's easy, and it's something we really do worry about. I'm sort of remiss not having mentioned that. But you know, as a theorist, I believe all stars have planetary systems. It just may not have been detected yet. Hot Jupiters are easy to see. They're around roughly 1% of stars. The, the uh, bigger Jupiters, the warm Jupiters, they are known by statistically to be around between, say, 10 and 20% of stars. The Earths are a little bit harder to find, but the folks who do the radio velocity surveys have claimed that between one third and one half of all solar type stars have the super Earths. That's, you know, so it's up to, you know, it's one. We can't see the one Earth mass object yet, but certainly things which are in five to 10 Earth masses and maybe doing a little extrapolation to lower. We're at the point where we're saying that probably you know, at least half of the stars have something at least a super Earth in mass. So within factors of two, that's everything. And given our uncertainties on all this, I would say that you know, it's going to be the odd star which has no planet whatsoever, which is incredible. You know, again, going from 15 years ago, nothing, to saying now we have real solid observational proof that essentially every star, or at least one in two, has something. It's incredible. You, know, right, you multiply the number of stars in the galaxy by the number of galaxies in the universe, and you have some really big number of planets. Binaries are a little bit harder, because if they happen to be a uh, 1AU binary, it's not going to have an Earth-like planet. But binaries, if they're far enough apart, indeed also have planets as well. We don't really quite know about the Earths in them, although we may be hearing from Deborah, because Alpha Centauri is a binary system. She'll have more to say about it. But theorists have made planets inside binary systems. A little bit trickier, but they can do it there. So binaries, where by definition they're too close, are going to preclude having planets there. But when they're far enough apart, or if they're close enough together, they can have a disk around them, they're probably going to have planets as well. It's just for, it's an inevitable process of the, planet, of the star forming process. Sorry. What are the time scales over which migration occurs, and what is the source of energy? Is it gravitational, or is it hidden source of energy for migration of stars? Uh, the, there are basically two ways for migrating planets. One is to have an initial configuration of planets which is gravitationally unstable and have them basically scatter off of each other. And that occurs rather quickly, like over maybe 100 orbital periods. That's a good way for kicking things out to other orbits and of putting them on highly eccentric orbits, which perhaps Deborah will, will speak about. But it's kind of hard to get close in planets that way. So the way that we think Jupiter's arose were from interactions with the disk, the leftover gas and dust that formed the planetary system. And the time scales for planets to migrate in can actually be quite short. It's one of the problems with one of the migrations mechanisms is that a Earth-like planet or 10 Earth-mass planet can migrate in in like 10,000 years. So there's a real danger of losing them without having some way of keeping them behind. Uh, once you get big enough, like Jupiter mass or so, you, you sort of open up a gap in the disk. You don't migrate so, quite so quickly. And then you're, you are locked with the disk. And as the disk evolves, you migrate along with it. Those disk evolution time scales depend on some unknown physics, but they're of order of millions of years. So all this process occurs while the disk is still there, which is known to be only a few million years at most. So you're talking about time scales of millions of years in the best case. The, the energy source is simply interactions with the disk. Let's say that, that you're on a close uh, galactic neighbor star. And given the technology that we have now, and you were looking at our solar system, mm -hmm. would you be able to detect the planets that we have here and the Earth 
or, or is it not quite, quite as fun? You know what I'm saying? You right, put right, yourself exactly, out right, there. Right, right. Do, do they know just, we're here? Yeah, and <laughs> looking at us, would, what, would these, what would these data look like? Would they okay. Look, they, well, they would look very much like this. I mean, a lot of the stuff I showed you were for stars which are sort of at, at 10 parsec type distances. Uh, basically, if the radio velocity folks were looking at our sun for 12 years or a little bit longer, they would see Jupiter. If uh, the orbit was aligned so that Earth transited, Kepler would see the Earth. Uh, and we don't quite have the radial velocity position to pick up on Earth. But we, yeah, we would be able to find, a lot, find out a lot about our solar system. We'd certainly be able to see Jupiter by the RV radial velocity wobble, we'd find all the planets if they transited. But that's sort of where we, and if we, if, if we happen to be passing in front of a K dwarf, the gravitational microlensing, they'd find us that way, we'd find uh, you know, so a few more. So those techniques would apply to us. So if someone else's other astronomers on another system are looking at us, they might very well know we're here and sending us radio messages right now, who knows? Yeah, yeah, this is, this, it's, we, we really built into this our feeling that we want to find something exactly like Earth. We want to be open-minded to things as well, but at the very least we want to be able to find something which looks like Earth, because that is our only proven example. So by definition, we're always saying, can we find an Earth-like planet? My, my question is sort of tangentially related to yours. Uh, the Epsilon Arrighi, I don't know how much you've been following that with the possible binary eclipsing, that has a very, very strange light curve. Could that possibly be a planetary system that we're seeing? Uh, it's one of these things where you just have to keep working on it. Uh, there, there are so several detections that are kind of marginal. I think that was, I'm trying to remember, that was an active star or not, but... Um, yeah, it's a variable star yeah, that has so, that very strange blip in the middle of it yeah, this it like, year. Yeah, uh, I think that's, it's a good candidate at this point, but we'd like to know a little bit more. There are many other cases where it's pretty clear cut and everyone agrees. This is one that's sort of a little, little question mark, asterisk next to it type mm -hmm. thing. Should be followed up and keep an eye on it. <laughs> um, you showed a graph that had uh, different densities of planets, mm -hmm. and I think it was 149026 had a high density, but also Jupiter had a high density. I'm guessing that Jupiter's high density is partly gravitational self-compression. Yes. Does that mean we cannot yet say we've seen anything close to the mass of Jupiter with a rocky core? And does that mean we can't yet infer that Jupiter formed kind of rocky core first, more like a planet than a star. Well, I, th I remember on that planet, I think there were a few other extrasolar planets which were more or less li like Jupiter, so they're a couple, but they do tend to be fluffier because those are the ones that you find first. In terms of our own Jupiter, the folks who have the most data about Jupiter's core, the folks who, f who fly things like the, uh, um, the Galileo mission around Jupiter and, and measure the, the gravity field of Jupiter very well, and when you do the, the theoretical modeling of Jupiter's interior, the main problem is not so much knowing the exterior gravitational field of Jupiter, it's knowing how hydrogen and helium behave at very high temperatures and pressures. It's all the equation of state. So if, depending on which equation of state you use, which I can give you a whole other talk about, you can either say that Jupiter has a pretty big massive core or else it has no core at all. So it's really kind of up to the physics people who do high pressure physics and, to tell us what Jupiter has inside. But that's a major puzzle because you can imagine if you do have a big rocky core, that sort of implies maybe the core came first. If there's no core there at all, you wonder how come it doesn't have a core because just about any way you can imagine making Jupiter, some sort of a core should form. So it's, it's a really major constraint on how planets form. Just as a simple teacher here, the binary, a distant binary would cause wobble how do I get out of that saying, well, uh, it's, not, it's a planet, it's not a distant binary? Mm -hmm. well, you, you know it from the period. Yeah, the, 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 the binary would give you a, a small, a similar amplitude, but the period would be much longer because the binary is way out there. So if it's a certain, you tie the amplitude to the period, and that tells you what the, what the mass of the perturber has to be. It's, kept, it's, kept, it's all tied together. I mean, right, you could have, you have a really massive object, giving you the, which is farther away, but it's farther away, which means it orbits much slower. So it's a combination of period plus amplitude. Uh, I'm wondering, um, you know, on the uh, general data sets that you have, uh, for the stars that are for the stars that are at the center of force, you know, that you're looking at, are they primarily all uh, like? Red dwarfs, I mean, do you have any, you, you have a G or a, mm -hmm. how many like uh, sure. K type stars are there? And would that spectrum change 
do you think as the stars got larger that were being examined had you the technology to see it that is one of the current areas of research the discovery space plus i showed you were mostly for g type stars much like the sun because people were again thinking let's see what sun like stars have first if we have to pick a sample let's start with the sun like stars because they should have little mini solar systems so that's what mostly we have but in addition folks are being able to go to lower mass stars, the K and the M dwarf stars are a little bit harder to do, especially the late M dwarfs, because they, their light is more infrared, not invisible. So the normal Doppler techniques are optimized for visible light stars. Uh, but there's a new techniques which should do the late M dwarfs as well. Folks are also beginning to look at a little bit more massive stars, uh, so-called A stars, uh, you know, 1.5 up to two Earth solar masses as well. So they're, we're trying to find out how the planet census depends on the mass of the star because again that's pretty important for knowing what's in the galaxy as well as informing theoretical models of how these things op how these things form so we kind of have pretty good numbers for g type stars and we're learning what's happening for a's and k's and m's so, well give us another 5 years and we'll, we'll know a lot more about it in fact you know other you know Deborah may very well speak about this because she's her group is one of the leaders in, in doing the census already one of the most impressive things about your work is the number of different ways you can detect planets and the ways you can confirm from different detections. I'm just wondering if there are uh, other detection methods that are on the horizon or that you would uh, really like to have mm -hmm. at your disposal and uh, if you got anything to add in that yeah. thing. Boy, boy, that's a wonderful segue into, uh, I actually have, at times I pretend to be a real astronomer, oh, well, we're only a theorist, they actually Carnegie gives me telescope time. I've got a ground-based planet search program trying to find planets the way that Peter Van de Kamp tried, by looking for that wobble. Astrometry has never found a planet, although there's been a recent claim which has since gone away, but like Barnard Star was incorrect. But we've yet to find one by looking for the indirect wobble of the star. That's how the Space Interferometry Mission hopes to find Earths, and if SIM gets built, it will do it. But there's still a challenge out there. Can we get astrometry to work? I'm crazy enough, you know, <laughs> at this point, no one cares what Alan Boss does anymore. So I can, I can you know, if, you know, young people have to worry about their career, but if I waste 10 years doing something which doesn't pan out, that's okay. Uh, but I really like to see astrometry work. I think it's sort of a, a tribute back to Peter Vandekamp uh, to say that, hey, you know, you weren't so crazy, this technique does work. That one is yet to work. That's a real challenge for, for the near term. It could be done right now. It's just a question of gathering enough data. I'm curious to know how the upper mass limit is determined for habitable Earths in the Goldilocks zone, thinking that uh, you know, geologic activity just increases as the mass goes up. Yeah, okay, so I think when I, sh when I showed you that, that uh, Goldilocks zone, that was, the upper limit was simply saying, let's pick a number, 15 Earth masses. There was no real physics behind it. But folks, as you can imagine, if you really start worrying about plate tectonics, about atmospheric composition, weather on the planets, you know, and perhaps Jim Caston will talk about this more. Uh, you, you, I mean, that's, that's a whole other area of research. So you should take that, that little blue box I put in there with a grain of salt. It's simply indicative of roughly where we want to go. In fact, here's a comment from Jim. I think really the upper limit is drawing. We think that if you get over about 10 Earth masses, you're going to capture a lot of gas from the nebula and turn it into a gas giant. It doesn't necessarily have to be the case, though, so, so that's not a very common one. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is the, the, the danger is the classic way of making gas giants is that once you get to roughly 10 Earth masses, you start pulling in a lot of gas rapidly. But if you happen to get to 10 Earth masses when the gas is mostly gone, you, you can avoid that. So there, there are ways of getting around that. Uh, you mentioned that almost uh, certainly all stars that are having a planet or some planets. Uh, did you revisit the Barnard star to find uh, any uh, planet on that? And if you couldn't find, why not? Uh, Barnard star was originally on my planet search list for my southern planet search, but it turns out Barnard star is, is still too bright for us. We cannot handle it with our camera. Uh, other teams have been following Barnard star. Uh, I think so far the only publications I've seen are upper, upper limits on what could be there. For example, Fritz Benedict is using the fine guidance sensors on Hubble Space Telescope to follow Barnard Star. 
basically the, what they've, what, what Barnard stars turn out to be is, is a diagnostic for mechanical problems on HST. Whenever they see Barnard star begin to wobble, they say, hey, we've got some problem with HST much of just, uh, no, literally, I mean, you know, basically whenever they figure out the mechanical problems, Barnard star just kind of goes rock flat. You know, it's moving across the sky, but it's not wobbling, at least not at a level that can be detected. But, uh, you know, it's a great candy. It's close by. We'd like to see what's there. It's going to continue to be followed up by every technique we have available. But so far, it's upper, upper limits only, I believe. Um, in, uh, I'm interested in the criteria you use in selecting what stars to look at for extrasolar planets. Like, do you look at heavy element enrichment and things like that? Uh, the radio velocity folks learned early on, after I think they'd found something like six or so hot Jupiters, that they tended to be around metal-rich stars. And so the feeling very quickly became, you know, you know it's like the, the drunk looking for his lights, his keys around the lampposts. That's where I can find them. Although there really were like a whole pile of keys around all the lampposts. So they began targeting, initially, metal-rich samples. Uh, and Deborah, perhaps, will, will speak about this. But in addition, folks realize, well, but not all stars are metal-rich. So they are, again, expanding the census to cover all metallicities. But certainly, solar-type stars and then metal-rich stars became favored places in order to rent, you know, run up the body count quickly to find more and more planets. Because there is this correlation with at least the hot Jupiters being around preferentially metal-rich stars. But they're, they're all different criteria. They're, they're probably. You know, I think there are a dozen or so ground-based transit surveys. There are you know, maybe a dozen or so serious worldwide Doppler surveys. There are lots of folks doing this, and they all, they're trying to find a different niche where they can do something unique. And so that tends to me, mean they're all going to try to find other little pieces of the puzzle to expand the census to, to look at everything. Because we don't really know for sure. You know, some places where you think there may not be star, uh, may not be planets, maybe they do. But if you don't look, you're not going to know that. Uh, when you look at, uh, can you look at radio waves from those uh, planets that you might be? There, there have been searches for exactly for that. Uh, Jupiter has a decametric radio emission, which was discovered by, by accident by one of my colleagues at, D at DTM back in the 1950s, Bernie Burke. Uh, they, they are running this Mills Cross array out in what is now a polo field in, in Potomac, and they found this source of noise in the sky, turned out to track with the sky, turned out to be Jupiter. They discovered Jupiter accidentally. Uh, but uh, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to because they were extra galactic. You know, J Jupiter was pollution for them. But you know, as a result, actually, NASA put Bernie Burke in charge of this first committee, in 1988, about finding planets. Because they figured, here's a guy who finds planets accidentally. You know, just you know, think what he could do if he was trying to. All right. So, uh, but folks uh, have tried. You know, they've there have done been a number of uh, serious radio wave surveys to try to find Jupiter-like decimetric emission from from known systems as well as just blind search, and they've yet to find anything. It's, it's kind of tough. You really have to have a very, uh, very, very strong EO plasma type torus in order to generate the you know, sort of emission that can be seen. But it's, it's not, not impossible. Emission like that has been seen around, uh, around dwarfs that are much more massive. Um, has the theoretical work done on understanding these exoplanets changed in any significant way the way we look at our solar system, uh, the formation of our solar system, and, and made us more confident in understanding? I think it's mostly undermined our, our what we thought we knew. You know, we, so, you know, we, we, I've been working on this you know, for, for a good 20 years, as long as other folks have been working uh, longer than that. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the big questions is why didn't our planets migrate? We still kind of understand. Our traditional models, there's a little bit of migration in the outer solar system. We want to move Uranus and Neptune out, maybe. But Jupiter and Saturn, Earth and Venus, pretty much, we think, are close to where they form. You know, maybe Jupiter moved in at 1 or 2 AU. But by and large, there's not much migration there. That's one of the problems. I think one of the, one of the explanations for that is the growing realization that we don't think that our solar system formed in isolation. It used to be that we always thought, let's do the simplest possible problem, one star, one disk, what happens? Most stars actually form in regions of where many stars are forming. It's a more complex environment. And so the things like the ultraviolet light from nearby massive stars can strip off our outer disk rather early on. And if there's no mass in the outer disk, there's no more disk migration, because Jupiter can only move in if it can give its angle momentum to some gas farther out. If that gas is gone, Jupiter is locked. So we probably think our disk did not last that long perhaps to explain migration. But there's also something we sort of hinted at, which is the basic idea of how did Jupiter form. Right now, we're not quite sure how much of a core Jupiter has. If it doesn't have much of a core, that might imply that it formed 
by something other than the core accretion mechanism, which has been the conventional wisdom where you build up a big rocky core first. Either that or maybe a way that the cores can dissolve and disappear in time, which is even more astounding if that's the case. So uh, we're sort of, it really does force all theorists to rethink how our own solar system formed, as well as trying to understand these other systems. Right now, I would say if there's a scoreboard for planetary systems and they're understanding how they form, it would be you know, observers 450, theorists zero. That's kind of, you know, we, we should start using, doing the score in log units, I think, at this point. Because, you know, <laughs> but then it's only two to, two to uh, well, can't take, can't take the log of zero, actually, so maybe that's not so good. Two to minus infinity or something like that. Yeah. Yes, um, and one of the slides that showed the direct, direct detection of the planet, so I was looking at one of them, it seemed quite a ways away from the star. So I'm wondering, what's the greatest distance from a star that they found one in terms of AUs? Yeah, yeah I should have pointed out, that was HR 8799 system. That was a bit of a surprise, because most theorists have not really talked about making planets out at 50, 60 AU. The Fomalhaut system was at, I think, 120 AU, roughly, is where that planet is. And that's even more of a mystery, I mean, 120 AU, but, but it's out in the middle of this big dust ring, so we know there's planetary-type material out there. But those are ongoing problems for theorists. I literally have in my briefcase back at the hotel a paper I'm working on where I'm trying to make planets at 50, 60, 70 AU, and the models are still running. And I can't quite publish the paper because I've got some lumps that look like they can make planets and some that don't. So it's a, literally an active area of investigation right now. Tell uh, the one of the purposes of these uh, workshops is for the audience to interact with the speakers. There are many opportunities to do that, and we want to encourage people to ask questions not only right after the talks but in the break sessions. Uh, so please, if you haven't had an opportunity to ask a question uh, close to personal, please uh, <coughs> call her the speakers before, during, and after. Um, and uh, let's thank Alan once again for a wonderful talk. And we start promptly at 10.30. Um, now we'll go to the break. Whew, that was a lot of, a lot of questions. <laughs> okay.